As we come towards the end of the series, I thought it would only be right to do at least one of the last few episodes about something viewers have told me to watch. Over the years, most of your requests have been anime. I'm so shocked. Death Note, Demon Slayer, One Piece, My Hero Academia. I've heard a ton of options, but of all the shows and movies you've asked for, Attack on Titan has always been one of the most consistent requests. Now, as you know, anime isn't really my thing. But since this is one of the last chances I have to do a viewer's choice episode, I did it. And while I have some serious issues with the show, particularly in the later seasons, there are a few things it got right. The action is intense and interesting. The characters are compelling and distinct. The symbolism is a bit heavy handed, but it is at least effective. But to be honest, I think that the most interesting and important themes about freedom and security featured in the first season actually get lost in the muddle of the political, military, and personal dramas that dominate seasons two, three, and four. What's even more of a shame is that the show never really comes back around to those ideas, but they're the ones I think are most worth discussion. So that's what I want to talk about today. Strap on your ODM gear because we're going Titan hunting on this episode of Out of Frame. First off, as always, there will be some spoilers for the entire series in this video, so consider yourself warned. If you haven't seen the show or just need a refresher, Attack on Titan is an animated series based on the manga by Hajime Isayama. The show takes place in an alternate history Earth and begins by following three young friends, Aaron, Mikasa, and Armin on what at first seems to be a pretty normal day. The hot-headed and extremely shouty Aaron interacts with some local soldiers, his stay-at-home mom, his physician father, and his friends. He and his buddies spot a different group of soldiers, the scout division, returning from a mission outside the walls and discover that not all of them made it home. It's soon revealed that the entire human race lives inside three concentric rings of massive walls in order to protect themselves from giant human-eating titans that roam the world outside. The walls have stood for a hundred years and have never once been breached, as long as humanity stays inside, where it's safe. But because foreshadowing like that can't go to waste, later that very day, two abnormals, titans that don't behave quite like the rest of them, breach the two gates in Aaron's home section of the wall. The town is quickly overrun with titans. Aaron's mother is devoured right in front of him, and thousands of others are crushed or eaten alive. I'll be honest, I wasn't really expecting that level of brutality, but this is the horrific nature of the world we're in. After the disaster, Aaron and his friends become refugees along with everyone else who survived the breach of the first wall. Five years later, Aaron, Mikasa, and Armin are finally old enough to go through military training and choose their division. Aaron is now single-mindedly dedicated to killing every last Titan in the world. He's determined to join the scout division when he completes his training, because it's the most dangerous and most likely to put him in a position to face his enemies. The other two divisions, the wall garrison and the military police, hold no interest for him. Those groups never leave the safety of the walls, and with the exception of the breach of the outermost wall, never engage with titans in battle. Mikasa joins the scouts as well, as does Armin, albeit for a very different reason. As a child, Armin discovered a forbidden book that talked about the world outside the walls. Plants and animals and geography that seemed impossible to a kid whose entire existence was defined by impenetrable boundaries. Aaron! Ugh, why are you shouting? Sorry, I found a book my grandpa keeps hidden away. Believe it or not, it's about life on the outside. I really hope this is your idea of a joke. Stuff about the outside world is illegal. Seriously, you could go to jail for that. Trust me, you'd change your mind if you knew what was actually out there. For example, according to this book, most of the world is covered with salty water so deep you can't reach the bottom. There's a name for it, too. They call it the sea. Like, salty for real? Come on, you're making it up. If something valuable like salt was just floating around underwater, merchants would have scooped it out ages ago. That's the thing. The sea never runs out. It's that big. Yeah, whatever. Just bear with me. There's a lot more than salt. Water that glows like fire. 
fields of ice, giant rocks that take days to climb. Imagine how huge the outside world must be. Armin shared all of this fantastic information with his friends when they were young, but most of them had lost all hope of ever seeing the world's various wonders as they'd grown older and learned to fear the Titans instead. But Armin did not forget his childhood dream, and the chance to explore outside the walls and see impossible things becomes his main motivation to join the scouts. But just before the friends officially choose their division, the walls are once again attacked by the abnormal titans, and the cadets are thrown into battle. In the chaos of the fighting, Eren is eaten by one of the titans, but in the process, somehow discovers a horrifying secret he can turn into a titan himself. As frightening and unpredictable as this ability is, the military decides to use Eren's titan form as a tool to seal the new hole in the wall and take back that tiny section of their world. It's in this struggle that we find the simple but profound declaration of what I think is the most important theme of the series. Why? Why throw caution to the wind and venture outside? We're born free, all of us, free. Some don't believe it, some try to take it away, to hell with them. Water like fire, mountains of ice, the whole bit. Lay your eyes on that, and you'll know what freedom is, that it's worth fighting for. All of us are born free. For those of us living in the U.S., that might not seem like such an unusual statement. It's sort of baked into our national mythology. But in the grand scheme of things, the idea that all humans are born with an inherent right to liberty is a pretty radical one. And it's rarely ever been upheld throughout history, especially not with any kind of consistency. But before we get into that, first we need to clearly define what we mean by rights. Because, well, a lot of people have really abused the term over the years. It gets thrown around a fair bit, but frequently a lot of people are using the same word to mean totally different things. A right to education, a right to food, a right to healthcare, a right to housing, a right to free cash, a customer's bill of rights. These things may be good and important to have. We even need some of them, like food and shelter. But rights are ethical constructs. They're the expectations and responsibilities we each have with respect to how we treat each other. More explicitly, rights are the ethical rules we view as unbreakable and universal. If there is to be such a thing as human rights, they must apply to everyone all of the time. But education, food, healthcare, housing, and all sorts of other things people claim they have a right to are actually goods and services. As such, they are the limited, scarce, material product of other people's labor, not merely actions or behaviors that are or are not acceptable. By saying you have the right to other people's stuff by the simple merit of being a human being is the same thing as saying that those people should labor for your benefit in exchange for nothing. What you're actually saying is that you have the moral authority to steal goods and services from the people who made or currently own them. For example, the claim that anyone who is sick should be provided with healthcare is, in reality, the claim that doctors and nurses may be forced to give their time and labor to someone else. It also means that anybody who produces the goods that are associated with that medical care, drugs, bandages, hospital beds, MRI machines, and so on, may be compelled to give up the products of their labor as well. The claim that people have a moral right to be given material stuff or to be provided free services is what some philosophers call positive rights. As you might imagine, these kinds of rights can easily become quite contentious. They impose a lot of highly unequal burdens on different people, actively rewarding those who don't produce and punishing those who do. They constitute an expense that someone else has to bear on your behalf. And they can only exist at all if they're enforced by a third party, typically government, that's capable of threatening people or putting them in jail if they refuse to comply. These kinds of rights should actually be understood as government-granted privileges, and they are not what we actually mean when we talk about natural rights. But before we get to that, let's go back to Attack on Titan. 
In the world presented to us in the show, as far as anyone seems to know, the people inside the walls are the only humans left on the planet. It might be safer there, but it's not particularly free. Literature and academic writing about the outside world have been outlawed. Ordinary people aren't allowed to leave. We even find out that the first king of the walls altered some of the memories of almost everyone living there to forget everything about the outside world. Few people have any idea what it's even like at this point. The world might be vast, or it might not be. But the only thing everyone knows for sure is that it's definitely filled with giant man-eating monsters. And yet, even children still yearn to go outside. Look at me. We should do it ourselves one day. We can have adventures like the guy who wrote this book. Pretty much all children reach for freedom. You probably did as a kid too. First, we roll over and sit up, then crawl, then walk, then run. We test every boundary, every restriction. We explore and try to see where our own efforts can take us, if we're allowed. That's why Aaron's sentiment about liberty is so important. And that idea seems to be somewhat prevalent throughout the entire scout division in Attack on Titan. The division's emblem is called the Wings of Freedom. We see squad commander Hanji enthusiastically pursue Titan research, regardless of how weird it makes her look. Even though it takes until midway through the third season, we also get a flashback from the commandant in charge of cadet training from his own scout days. You think so, do you? That means you're just like the rest. Huh? We're trapped inside these walls. But as long as there's plenty of food and alcohol to go around, most people are just fine with that. In their whole lives, they'll never question how wide the world might be. Is that why you risk your life to venture outside the walls? To see how wide the world is? That's right. Does it seem foolish? No, quite the opposite. The scouts are wiser and braver than anyone else living within the walls. Their very existence is living proof that the imagination and soul of mankind are still free. But most people aren't scouts. They live an imprisoned life inside the walls. They've sacrificed their freedom for a sense of safety. The idea of natural rights is a mystery to them, as let's be honest, it is to most people in the real world. So let's talk about that. What we mean when we talk about natural rights is that we should be free from experiencing certain kinds of behavior at the hands of other people. This is what philosophers call negative rights. We're talking about rights not to be assaulted, murdered, raped, or stolen from. Unlike positive rights or privileges, a natural right doesn't cost anyone anything. Not their time, not their resources, not their labor. It doesn't impose a requirement on anyone to do anything at all, merely to abstain from perpetrating harm against other people. Thus, natural rights can exist even if there are only two people on Earth, even if there are no doctors or farmers or clothing makers or home builders who produce the things a lot of people claim to have a right to in modern society. Natural rights should still exist inside the safety of high walls and can be protected by government, but can also be justly defended by individuals against each other out in the wild. The concept of natural rights was put forward by Cicero and later Thomas Aquinas, but it wasn't really until John Locke that the concept became more widely known and accepted. Locke defined natural rights as the morally legitimate defense of life, liberty, and property. Life, in that you have the right not to be killed or harmed by others, and by extension, the right to protect yourself from people and things that would do so. Liberty, in that you have the right not to be enslaved or unjustly imprisoned, and by extension, the right to due process. Property, in that you have the right to the ownership of your own body and mind, and by extension, the right to the products of your own efforts to not have those things taken or used without your consent and to express yourself however you see fit. These three core rights naturally lead to other more specific rights, many but not all of which are outlined in the first 10 amendments of the US Constitution. These rights are not gifts from government. They are not based upon largesse or plunder. They aren't achieved by taking anything from anyone else. 
They can either be protected or violated, but they cannot cease to exist because they are moral concepts. So when Aaron says that we're born free, he's being very literal. Now, as we grow and learn, some of our inherent tenacity for freedom goes away. That's not always a bad thing. The world is dangerous. We all have to learn how to keep ourselves tolerably safe. We also have to learn to respect the rights of others and figure out how to interact peacefully with the people in our society. These are good and necessary restrictions on ourselves. But many people, particularly those who fear the outside world and worry about ever encountering anything that makes them uncomfortable, take it further, trying to impose restrictions on everyone else far beyond the universal limits ascribed by the theory of natural rights. Sometimes they mean well, but they've forgotten or just stopped believing that every person has the right to be free. But we do. Each of us has the right to live our own life however we see fit, so long as we're not violating the natural rights of others. Unfortunately, like so many people in the real world, Aaron also loses sight of this fact, which is a big disappointment I have with Attack on Titan. Instead of Aaron growing as a person to match his heroic intentions, at some point he decides that the best way to achieve his goals was to literally kill everyone else on the planet. But even though Aaron's character arc taking a turn towards the tragic is a personal disappointment, it does provide an important warning. Yes, Aaron wants to protect his people. Yes, there are powerful forces in the outside world who would see all of the inhabitants of his home wiped out. But the best way to protect the natural rights of Aaron's people is not to violate the natural right to life of everybody on the planet. Even when the rest of the world thinks your people are literal devils, the solution is definitely not to prove them right. When the rest of the world thinks you're a terrible person because of your ethnicity, your likes and dislikes, or your worldview, the worst thing you could do is live up to their most sensational stereotypes. Natural rights offer the moral justification for self-defense, not the destruction of everybody else. It's about putting down the sword eliminating aggressive violence from the world, not becoming so powerful that you crush everything that's good in it. Attack on Titan might have lost this idea a little bit over the course of the series, but as long as you reject the impulse to violence, anger, and lust for power, and commit yourself to the defense of everyone's universal rights to life, liberty, and property, you can be the hero this show struggles to find. Hey everybody, thanks for watching this episode of Out of Frame. Y'all know I'm not the most knowledgeable anime fan out there, so I'm sure I missed something you probably wish I'd talked about. Feel free to bring up all the themes and ideas that you care about with Attack on Titan in the comments. As always, I want to thank our supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar, and give a special shout out to our associate producers. Thank you. For everyone else, definitely still subscribe to the channel, click that bell icon to get notifications for the final few episodes of the show and for all our new content coming up, and follow us on all the social media. I'll see you next time.